Hello, everybody, and welcome back to session three at Casa Linux Target 2021. Um, for those who have just joined, there is an IRC channel um, associated with this session. So if you have any questions um, for, the, for, the, um, for this talk, um, you can post them there. Um, the next talk um, we are having here is photovoltaics and how to use them in your do-it-yourself electronic projects by Irene Schickbauer. Irene is not with us in the, in the live stream today, but he is in the um, IRC channel with the username Kevac, that's C-A-V-A-C. -A um, so if you have any questions, just ask him um, during the talk or afterwards. Um, the, the video itself is recorded, the talk itself is recorded, and we will um, just um, replay that um, after the introduction. So Arene is an um, old timer here at the Linux Tage, a dinosaur, so to speak, like myself. Um, he has been with us for decades and has always um, great things to show and to tell. So um, without further ado, um, Rene, you have the word. People call me Kevek on the internet. I've been running um, solar projects in my garden for a number of years in the course of the garden space program. Uh, wait, you don't know what that is. Let's roll the trailer. The garden on the most popular island that does not exist. Welcome to the Null Island Space Agency where we learn about doing space missions without space and without any budget but at least it's open source let's call it the garden space program after doing solar projects in my garden for a number of years i want to share what i learned uh, how it works um, so you can do it in your own projects and at the end of the talk, I'm uh, gonna release some hardware you can use as your basis or inspiration for your own projects. Okay, let's take a look at which general components a solar system has so you can run your own projects. First, of course, you have some solar panels. Then what you need is uh, some sort of charge controller because the voltages of a solar panel fluctuate during the day and you don't have any power during the night. So we have a charge controller. We need some batteries. And we need your electronics some sort of, I don't know, Arduino, for example. And depending on which type of battery you have, you might also need uh, some sort of battery management system, uh, uh, BMS, which is between the charge controller and the battery. It's important to understand that those components are all interdependent. Uh, you, you need to size the solar panels depending on your battery and your load and you can uh, you, you have to tweak your load so you can run it off your your system the charge controller needs to be sized to those components battery management needs to be sized for this component so let's take it one step at a time the first thing we're gonna look at is the battery because that's really the heart of the system and the battery size really depends on your load. Uh, you need to figure out how much power you're gonna use and then um, 
size the battery so the project can run overnight with some extras you might have days where you can't charge because uh, of bad weather or snow or whatever um, and my rule of thumb is um, I want to run uh, my electronics purely on battery for at least seven days because if there's snow on the panel um, then you might have a week or so before you can clean it off or it, the snow melts. You have um, multiple um, types of batteries to choose from. Uh, the most common is lead acid. Then you have um, nickel metal hydride which is very often used in those small solar lights you get for a few euros. Um, then you have uh, lithium ion, which is, you know, the explodey kind of batteries. Um, then you have uh, the LiPo batteries which are used in drones and so and then you have uh, a special type of lithium battery Life P O 4 which is a more stable kind um, in theory you can use other battery types like um, um, the cadmium batteries um, they are now sort of illegal as far as I know but they were used in some uh, small solar projects uh, many decades ago and they are proved to be very stable so if you can get them you can experiment with them. Let's take a look at uh, those uh, battery types and uh, look a bit at the pros and cons of them. Let's start by excluding some. Lithium ion is, well it has a big capacity for its size but it has quite a few problems. Uh, with all those uh, lithium types you need a battery management system that can get complicated and sort of expensive but uh, lithium ion is um, very unstable when it comes to temperature. If it gets too hot it explodes. If it freezes and you, you try to charge it, it might explode when it gets warmer. So I tend to not use it because it's just too much of a hassle and frankly I don't want to plant small bombs all over my garden. So mm, there's that. Lithium polymer has the same problem, plus it's even a bit more demanding than lithium iron and is even worse when you accidentally discharge it too far and yeah. Life EPO4 um, is uh, more and more upcoming in in the market to replace uh, lead acid and stuff but it's very very expensive compared to other battery types so uh, for you can look into it but for my part I decided against using that kind of technology at the moment because it's just 
too expensive for hobby projects. Uh, this uh, Live EPO4 is um, it's worth if you uh, need something that's relatively lightweight compared to other battery types for the same capacity but if you just uh, plonk it down in your garden uh, it doesn't really matter how much it weighs the postal worker might complain because he just has to deliver a 20 kilo battery but frankly that's not your problem so uh, Nickel metal hydride is good for very small, very low demanding um, uh, electronics, but it also has, well, it, if you need more capacity, that's way too expensive and it also doesn't really work when it gets too cold. So let's look at lead acid battery. It's very easy to use. It's, um, of course, you might say, why well, it has lead in it, so it must be dangerous. But frankly, um, it has be lead acid batteries ha have been used for over a hundred years now. They're in every car. The batteries are very easy to recycle and your charging circuit can be as simple as it can get with any uh, with any battery technology. Um, it, it's lead acid is basically you it uh, for solar it looks like a car battery but uh, the plates are thicker and, and, and some small details but basically think of a much better car battery you know the box with the two terminals um, it's very stable at pretty much all temperatures that humans can survive at, so um, that's a bonus. It's relatively maintenance free. It's, as I said, easy to charge and discharge. And this is also the battery type for which most uh, pre-made solar charge controllers are designed for. So, um, the charge controllers are also cheaper and the battery itself per uh, kilowatt hour per unit of energy lead acid is pretty much the cheapest technology you can find and it's very reliable over a number of years. Next, let's look at solar panels and they're pretty easy to understand the basic uh, the two um, informations you need about them is the max voltage and the optimum voltage for taking out power. I explain that more when we come to the charge controller. And yeah, then you have um, the watt rating. Let's say you have a panel of 100 watt. You might say, oh great, yeah, I get 100 watts out of it. Um, no. Not likely. Uh, the rating is basically um, if you're on the perfect day on the equator and the solar panel points exactly in the direction of the sun, then you get um, 
100 watt out if your charge controller uses the optimum voltage basically so uh, in summer you can say uh, I always uh, say okay um, I have you can have tracking panels that move and always point at the Sun but um, those are expensive they're complicated they need maintenance so a fixed in installation um, is usually the best compromise especially since um, solar panels get cheaper all the time and it's just easier to buy one more solar panel than to buy a tracking solution that's probably cost 10 times like what the solar panel costs. So in summer you might get out during noon you might get out like 80 watts and in winter on bad weather you might get out like 5 to 10 watts and that's the number you're usually working with and um, depending on the length of the day and the angle of the sun you might get that out for one hour, two hours, maybe six hours in summer. It really depends on your location. But um, for sizing the system, you always want to use the lowest number. So let's say your location is not optimal because you know you live somewhere where there's mountains or there's some trees or whatever uh, let's say you get 5 watts for 2 hours that means you get 10 watt hours um, at, uh, and then you have some losses so in the battery you might only get 8 watt hours and that's your energy budget of course then you have to to work out you want a reserve so not every day charges so you might have to size your panels and your electronics to run on like say one or two watt hours a day which is completely achievable it's it, it's um, even for complicated radio controlled projects um, you can do it I'll show you later the next step uh, in designing your solar system is selecting a charge controller. First you need to know the type of battery you're using because you need a battery controller, a charge controller that supports that. Um, lead acid, as I said, is the most common type currently. so most charge controllers you'll find online are lead acid type charge controllers then you need to know the maximum uh, rating of your solar panels uh, in terms of volts and amps most charge controllers um, or at least the better ones will um, support panels that deliver more amps 
uh, then their rating they just don't take the power but some of the cheap um, charge controllers will just go up in flames let's say you have um, a solar panel that at maximum and this is one of the times you really need to use the maximum rating that will deliver up to um, say 100 watts at 20 volts so you have a maximum rating of say 5 amps but depending on the charge controller and the voltage you you might you want to size it for 10 amps so let's say that's our um, that's our budget um, and you really need to check the data sheet of the charge controller that it really supports that and what happens if you if the solar panels would deliver more ampere if it if it really just either it says okay I will only charge at 10 amps no matter how much power you deliver or it will say never ever put more power in and you want the, the one that just doesn't care and just doesn't burn out if you accidentally deliver more power and the other thing you want to know is you have two types of charge controller you have PVM and you have MPPT that's pulse width modulation so uh, basically the controller if if we look at the power delivered to the battery we'll just turn it off and on and off and on and off and that works to a certain extent the those charge controllers are usually very 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 cheap um, but please don't buy them they're junk I mean yes they work to some extent but what you really want is maximum power point tracking charge controllers they uh, will try to maximize the amount of power they get out of the solar panels and that's uh, what I mentioned here uh, with the let's say uh, where do I have that find it uh, that the optimum voltage uh, of the, of the um, solar panel that's not the maximum voltage but uh, you pull a certain uh, power the voltage drops and uh, at some point uh, if you look at the voltage of the panel if you say you, you pull more power the voltage drops um, and the current the ampere rises and at some point um, you get the maximum power out and that's what um, what an MPPT charge controller does uh, it's think of it as black electronic magic but it just works you get more efficiency and what's more important on days where you don't have direct sunlight it often works uh, better because um, yeah because it just does uh, I could go into the details but then we have a 10 hour lecture on this and one other thing for the charge controller you want to look at is connectivity uh, many charge controllers have, have some sort of display but 
that's usually useless uh, unless you stand in front of it and read the values. What you really want to do is uh, one uh, is um, interface where you can read out the data automatically and usually it's Modbus. And this really helps you lock the data and see how you can improve your system. There is one more thing you might uh, need to know when you have multiple solar panels and that is uh, you can hook them up in series or in parallel. If you hook them up in series, especially with the cheaply available uh, commercial panels, basically you have those panels and your charge controller. You have one wire here, 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 and then you go there. That's the setup uh, that's probably in the manual of your charge controller, but you really have to keep on uh, an eye on the maximum voltage of the system. And it has a problem if, let's say, this solar panel is shaded, then the whole voltage drops and it really gets inefficient and even a partial shading because like it's autumn and there are leaves on the panel can have a um, very bad effect on the efficiency of the panels. The other way is um, let's lift this over. the other way is to hook them up in parallel and this, that has also the benefit that you can use uh, slightly different panels, especially if you build them on your own. That's uh, a real benefit. And if one is shaded, then that one doesn't produce power or not, a, not as much, but uh, it, it works... Um, much more efficient, especially for smaller systems. And basically you have, you have your panels here. One side is common that goes to the charge controller and then you have, then you add some protection diodes, uh, and put that on a common bus and so if one uh, panel fails everything else works uh, if if one is shaded then the other still produce their maximum power they can with the sunlight okay let's take a look at the electronics you have basically two types you can use. You can use something that's Arduino based or you have those ESP32 thingy magics. I use them some but I'm not really happy about uh, how they work and then you have Arduinos. They work but uh, their biggest problems is their voltage converter. Let me explain. Um, if you have a 12 volt LED acid battery, um, that doesn't mean you get 12 volt out of it. Uh, depending on the charge state, uh, you might get from about 11 volt to uh, up to 15 volts. Those things can't handle 15 volts very well. As I had some burnout, some work, 
very inefficiently. They have linear regulators. You really want to avoid those. Linear regulators are basically a, a big resistor and then your Arduino and then the terminals to the battery, right? And um, the, say you, you need 5 volt here, you got 15 volt here and the rest of the, of the energy basically gets, uh, the, gets out as heat. That's bad, that's inefficient and if you put in 15 volts it will dissolve itself depending on exactly which manufacturer and which version of Arduino you get. And the other problem with um, standard Arduinos is also very dependent on the manufacturer and which version and, and which, you know, depending on the uh, the the three point three volts uh, regulator on this is usually junk. It works exactly enough to run the Uno itself, but as soon as you put some load on it, it just doesn't work anymore. Usually, so. Um, but I like the idea of them, but it just. It, the, the other problem with using a standard Arduino or those things for the matter, for that matter is uh, besides the, the crappy voltage reg regulation they have a lot of stuff on board that you really don't need in the field and that just sucks power like uh, a USB chip and LEDs. If this thing is out in the field in a box, uh, you don't need a power LED. You don't need USB. Uh, and both of these, uh, you can't really update them in the field. There are some ways around it, but yeah, it, it, it's a pain in the seating arrangement. That's why I come up with, uh, let me grab it, this. This is a Radio Duino. Um, you can find all the information on, on this link here. And uh, it has a lot of features, these things just don't. It has a proper power reg regulation. Um, it, it works up to 40 volts, uh, from 7 to 40 volts. You basically, if you don't need, to, need it to work at night, you can just hook up the solar panel and you're done. It has uh, NRF uh, 24 um, the radio communication. It's basically the same band as 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, but it's a narrow band thing which has a range of this module, I think, uh, 1.5 kilometers if you have line of sight. Um, like a hundred meters if you don't, depending exactly on your circumstances. Um, it has an onboard uh, real-time clock that works even if you uh, take power away. It has various power saving features. It has mod boost to talk to controllers like this and to daughter boards. And it has onboard uh, what 
256 kilobyte onboard EEPROM to store data. Uh, no SD card at the moment because I found them unreliable, especially mechanically. Uh, if this is outside for like a year or something and it warms up and it cools down, then the SD card has a tendency to just work its way loose and then you have to go out and fix it and whatever. Um, it has FRAM, which is ferromagnetic RAM, something uh, which keeps its um, its memory even if you power off and power on, and it has practically in indefinite uh, uh, infinite write cycles. And um, yeah, this this is a hardware I'm releasing open source. There there is this software, there is this hardware for this. I'm still working on it. And as soon as I finish the new bootloader, you have the option of sending a new Arduino image uh, through NRF24 and tell it to uh, flash the new image to the processor. So it's fully OTA com compatible and it, the, the software libraries are pretty much standard except for a few bug fixes I have to make. And the idea is this is a base system and you plug in smart boards that have their own processor. The Radio DNA itself does all the power management. Uh, it can uh, go to deep sleep where it only uses about 8 milliampere at 10 volts. So uh, it's what 0 0.08 watts which means it can run a really, really long time on even a small lead acid battery and you only need like once a week recharging if, if that at all. I'm currently working on a few smart boards for this. One is an intelligent um, power distribution system so you have eight channels you can switch. I'm working on H bridge modules so you can control motors. I'm working on a servo module uh, where you can control servos. I'm working on a stepper motor control module where you can control stepper motors so uh, for all your robotics needs. And I'm also have, I also have a prototype of, let me move this. This is a very uh, ugly prototype uh, for an inverter module, a low power inverter that can generate a 240 volts with the help of some transformers to uh, so you can uh, transmit power from your solar system over longer distances and every one of those modules can be radio controlled or automated or both with the help of the base radio Duino. And every one of those modules can either be uh, plugged in as uh, like an Arduino shield or can be mounted somewhere else and controlled with a Modbus. And this is unfortunately the point where I need to ask your help. Prototyping those things and then making PCBs and testing them and, and making a version 2, version 3, version 4, whatever, does cost a lot of money. 
and um, currently with the pandemic going on um, money is a bit tight in the Null Island Space Agency so uh, you, you find ways of helping me out financially at the Null Island Space Agency website for one thing, I have uh, an online shop thingy where you can buy t-shirts and mugs and socks and whatever uh, with uh, with the Null Island logo and, and, and I'm working on, on other uh, sh shirts as well. And you can donate to me via PayPal and I'm currently also working on a Patreon thingamajig because that really helps me out. Uh, one prototype board currently uh, uh, with with multiple iterations. It, it's easily for me 200 euros um, before I get a working version and then I need to test it and if I have a problem I need to make another one and so on and so forth. So um, if you're interested in helping me out I would really appreciate it because as I said I'm releasing everything open source, open hardware so really donations is the only thing that can help me speed up uh, making more stuff because currently I can only do mm, a prototype uh, one prototype a month maybe every other month if I'm lucky so please help okay that's it um, thanks for watching and Hopefully next year we can meet in person uh, when this pandemic thingy is finally over. Bye! Thank you, Reni. This was an awesome talk, really. Um, um, not just the content, um, also the presentation style. Uh, I loved it. And I saw comments in the RSC channel that um, other people agree with me. Um, I also saw there was a, lot, was a lively discussion already in RSC. So um, I, I am also sure you will hang around for a, a, a bit longer. So I'm just again thanking you for the for this for this talk, and um, I think we can uh, close the session now. Thank you again, Reni.